Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. We're so excited that you are here with us today. My name is Andrea Baer, and I am the executive director here at Mended Hearts. And we are having an amazing webinar today on coronary artery disease and heart failure with Dr. Bogues. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So if you have a question though, please type it into the question and um, Q&A box. Jody Smith is here with us today and we will be moderating those questions out to Dr. Bogave throughout the session or at the end of the session, but you don't have to wait till the end to put your question in. Um, at any time during the presentation, you can put it in the Q&A box. Um, the slide presentation, uh, as along with the recording of the webinar will be available on the Mended Hearts website at following the event. So with that said, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Bogave. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. And um, I will let you take it over. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you, Mended Hearts, for allowing me the opportunity to chat with you today. I was asked to talk to you about coronary artery disease and heart failure. As a cardiologist who practiced for 20 years, I focused on patients who had heart failure or a weak heart. And when we look at the cause of heart disease in the United States, it actually it is primarily due to coronary artery disease or plaque buildup in the arteries that supply blood to our heart. Coronary artery disease mm -hmm. and heart disease actually in fact accounts for one in four deaths. So that's an alarming number, not only here in the US, but globally. So it's a major health problem worldwide. What's sad to say is when I finished my training in 1999, yes, over 20 years ago, and we looked at death rates from heart disease and specifically heart failure, you can see on these heat maps, there's a lot of blue. But despite advances in both medications and devices and treatments for patients who had heart failure, we see a lot more red in the latest time segment, both in patients who are younger, ages 35 to 64, as well as those patients who are older, 64 and older. And that red tells us even more patients are dying from heart failure despite the technological advances and the advances in medications, uh, we're still losing more patients today who are not benefiting from those therapies. And in fact, when you look at the cause of heart failure, most of the time it's due to blockages in coronary arteries. In fact, mm -hmm. more than 50% of the time, the cause of heart failure is due to coronary artery disease or a decrease in blood flow to the heart muscle. But what's alarming is even recent studies who looked at patients that were admitted to the hospital for their first episode of heart failure, they weren't even tested for coronary artery disease. And you might ask, why is that so? Why wouldn't patients be tested for the most common cause of heart failure? And it's because sometimes patients have chest pain, which we've all been taught in medical school and even most, um, most people relate a heart attack to having chest pain and crushing chest pain and a sense that somebody's standing on your chest. But in fact, that's not the most common symptom for women. And women, really, studies have shown 1% or less of women will have typical symptoms of a heart attack that are crushing chest pain with sweating and shortness of breath and the pain radiating down their arm where it is a common presentation for men. In addition, diabetics. Diabetics have nerve problems and they don't feel pain. So often a diabetic who presents with a decreased blood flow or a heart attack might not have chest pain. So you can see why it might be missed in patients who present with heart failure symptoms. So you might ask, what is heart failure? Heart disease encompasses everything that affects the heart itself. Heart artery disease or coronary artery disease, which is due to plaque buildup, we associate with high cholesterol, but also a heart attack actually happens when the clot buildup doesn't obstruct the flow, 
but only causes maybe a 40% blockage in that heart artery. What happens is inflammation. Inflammation to that plaque buildup, which I think of as like a volcano. And the inflammation inside causes that plaque to rupture and a blood clot forms, and that's how a heart attack happens. Inflammation can be caused by smoking. It can be caused by diabetes. It can be caused by stress. And yes, it can even be caused by a virus, the flu, or even COVID-19. So lots of things can contribute to inflammation to lead to a heart attack, but the buildup of plaque in the coronary arteries can limit the blood flow and cause a weak heart muscle. So what is heart failure? Heart failure is anything that can cause a decreased pumping function of the heart. So it can be something that affects primarily the heart muscle itself. It can be an inherited problem, or it can be due to high blood pressure, and the, and the heart's worked so hard pumping against a high blood pressure, it's now become weak, or it can be due to decreased blood flow from blockages in the coronary arteries. Heart failure symptoms are often more subtle, and they can be gradual, and they can sneak up on patients. Uh, and maybe patients don't even recognize they're having heart failure symptoms and they attribute their increased tiredness to I'm not exercising or have gained some weight with the, the COVID-19 lockdown. It can be shortness of breath. If you're having shortness of breath climbing up a flight of steps, you might think, oh, I'm just out of shape, but it could be your heart's not able to pump additional blood flow to help you meet the demand of climbing stairs versus walking flat. It can be you're having shortness of breath at night and having to sit up in your bed because your lungs uh, are filling up with fluid and you have a sense of suffocation when you wake up in the middle of the night. So all of these symptoms can be due to heart failure and can actually be due to the blockages in the heart arteries. So this is a card I wanted to share with you that we give to physicians to help physicians identify patients who might be at high risk of heart artery disease and heart failure and they may benefit from some of these more innovative therapies and to consider referring these patients for evaluation. So if you are a loved one who's been admitted to the hospital for heart failure, um, that, that is the primary sign that you need to be focused on. And recent studies have shown even a patient admitted to the hospital just once has a 30% risk of dying in the next 12 months. That's, that's a prognosis that can be worse than most forms of cancer. But the good news is there's a lot that can be done about the heart failure once we know what's causing heart failure, but you have to be evaluated for those causes. If you've been told you're not eligible for heart surgery because your heart's too weak, perhaps you have heart artery blockages and need to have a bypass surgery, but your heart muscle is too weak and the surgeon feels like it's too high risk. Or maybe there's a heart valve issue. And again, your heart's too weak. The surgeon's not comfortable doing heart surgery where you have to go in a heart lung machine. And that can be risky when the heart muscle's weak. If you've had bypass surgery in an operating room, but your bypasses are now blocked, that can also be a concern and put you at higher risk for a second bypass surgery. If you've been told you had chronic heart failure or you've had multiple admissions, to the hospital, that can also be a concern. If you're having chest pain or angina, which can encompass, yes, chest pain, but for some people who don't have chest pain, their angina, which signifies you're not having enough blood flow to your heart muscle, might be that you're short of breath or that you're tired. Um, and that is your angina equivalent. If that recurs over and over again, despite medications or even prior attempts to improve the blood flow, that can be a concerning sign. And you may be a candidate for a more advanced protective procedure. Um, if you've been told you have coronary artery disease and blockages that are severe, that can also be concerning. And perhaps you might be a candidate for a protected PCI, which we're gonna talk about. And if your weakened heart muscle is starting now to affect your kidney function, that also is a sign that you may need uh, specialized care from an advanced center that specializes in protected PCI or protected revascularization. Mm -hmm. 
Additional risk factors can include if you have diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and you're not able to tolerate some of the medications to improve both symptoms of angina or symptoms of heart failure. So how do, how do we manage patients that have blockages in their heart arteries and a weak heart muscle? Well, the first goal is to try to improve the blood flow to the heart muscle so the heart can pump better. And we can achieve that with several strategies. We can try medications to improve blood flow and open up little collateral blood vessels that are getting around blockages or decrease the stress on the heart by lowering your heart rate and better controlling your blood pressure. But we also like to improve blood flow to the heart muscle itself. And we can do that in several strategies. In the cardiac catheterization laboratory, an interventional cardiologist can do a very minimally invasive procedure to place a wire inside the heart artery and place a stent to open up those blockages and improve the blood flow. A surgeon can take a patient to the operating room where they put you on a heart lung machine to provide blood flow to the rest of your body while they rest your heart and so bypass grafts directly to the artery supplying blood to the heart muscle itself. So we call both of those strategies revascularization. PCI stands for percutaneous coronary intervention, and that's performed in the cath lab by an interventional cardiologist. And mm -hmm. coronary artery bypass grafting or cabbage is performed by a surgeon in an operating room. When you have a weak heart muscle, both the interventional cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon are very concerned about a patient's ability to tolerate the stress of the procedure and get through the revascularization procedure without causing um, further compromise to their heart function. So we consider things called hemodynamic support to help you unload the heart, rest the heart, so the cardiologist or the surgeon can achieve complete revascularization. And I wanted to share with you a video about protective PCI using the Impala device in the cardiac catheterization laboratory to take over the work of the heart while a, a cardiologist can perform a protective PCI. So as you can see, the Impella device is very small, and I'm holding this up so you can see with the base of my hand how very small this device is. It's placed in the femoral artery, and this little pigtail sits inside the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart. The blood enters the inflow, um, and that pulls the blood through the heart and out the outflow above the aortic valve. And that's how it provides blood flow to the heart and decreases the workload of the heart while a cardiologist can open up the arteries to provide better blood flow to the heart muscle. So 
the Impella device is the only FDA approved device that can be placed in a cardiac catheterization laboratory outside the operating room to provide this level of support to the heart muscle so the interventional cardiologist can more safely open up one, two, or even three heart arteries to improve blood flow to the heart muscle and improve the function of the heart. We often talk about something called ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is the percentage of blood in that main pumping chamber, the left ventricle, that's pumped forward every time the heart beats. Whenever your ejection fraction falls below 40, we get more concerned. A normal ejection fraction is between 55 and 70. So when patients undergo a protected PCI procedure, which provides improved blood flow to the heart muscle, we see um, that they have an improvement in their heart failure symptoms. They have less shortness of breath. They'll have less chest pain. If they've had chest pain, they have more energy and they're able to be more active. We also see over um, the last decade, many fewer complications with this procedure. We've seen improvement and best practices by physicians in implanting the device. So there's less bleeding complications in the femoral artery. There's less problems with the blood vessel, um, with the placement of this device, and importantly, the removal of this Impala device. So that's what we mean by reducing major adverse cardiovascular events. And so it's a much safer device and has the opportunity to both improve your heart function as well as your quality of life and allow you to get back to enjoying the activities you previously enjoyed. Patients also often stay in the hospital less time and are less often admitted back to the hospital for chest pain or heart failure symptoms. So with that, I'd like to stop sharing um, our slides. And I know we're joined today by a patient, Justin, and would like for you to hear from Justin, his story of undergoing a protective PCI procedure and just what it's done for Justin and his symptoms of heart failure. Hi. Uh, Thank you so much. What amazing information, and I appreciate it. We are working now to get Justin in um, as a panelist, and so he will be able to share. But in the meantime, while we are um, awaiting that, him joining, can I ask a couple of questions that have come from the audience? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. The first one um, is, can you have heart failure due to a drug or virus without having coronary heart disease? A absolutely. Uh, we have seen heart failure from COVID-19. I know we're all uh, acutely aware of that virus, but you can also see it from other very common viruses that maybe even someone else in your family had the same virus, but it didn't affect their heart muscle. We don't fully understand why it affects some patients and not others, but it can. And it can be very common viruses um, that someone else in your family may have just had you know, a small cold, but for you, it could have affected their heart muscle. Um, we also see it from toxin. Believe it or not, alcohol is a common toxin. And daily intake of alcohol over many years can contribute to heart muscle weakness, or what we call cardiomyopathy, where it primarily affects the heart muscle and doesn't affect the coronary arteries. We can see it from chemotherapy. Patients who undergo chemotherapy for breast cancer or lymphoma are at high risk of developing heart failure that can even appear as long as 10 years after they receive their chemotherapy. Um, so, Sometimes it can be a genetic abnormality that may not present till you're in your 20s or 30s. Um, and we see that there, we're now identifying more and more genetic abnormalities um, that we can test before patients ever develop symptoms to know that they're at high risk and hopefully prevent them from developing heart failure. Great. So the next question says, you showed a slide earlier indicating that more people are dying from CAD today than before. Why is that? Is it because we're living longer? 
So that, that is um, a great question. And it's not just coronary artery disease, but it's heart failure associated with coronary artery disease. I, I think there are several factors that contribute to why we're seeing an increase in mortality from the heart failure due to coronary artery disease is because our treatment with acute heart attacks has allowed patients to survive their heart attack, but then they subsequently develop heart failure after surviving a heart attack. Um, so we now have strategies that identify patients very early in the process when you call 911 that you're having chest pain. Um, even the ambulance um, um, folks, the EMS folks can diagnose a heart attack before you ever arrive at the hospital. And upon arrival, we can whisk you straight to the cardiac catheterization laboratory and open up that artery before you have a chance to develop um, heart failure. Unfortunately, the coronary artery disease can progress and cause heart failure months or even years later. Great. Um, and the next question is, are there risks associated with the protected PCI? Yes. Um, and, and just on the previous question, one other contribution is diabetes. We are having an epidemic of diabetes. And diabetics most commonly die from cardiovascular complications. And so diabetes is a primary risk factor for developing coronary artery disease, as well as smoking. And there are risks with a protected PCI. Um, as I showed you, this is the device. It's considered a device that requires large bore access. So it's a, a larger catheter placed in the femoral artery and early on, we saw bleeding complications and even complications to the blood vessel. But over the last 10 years, we've been able to develop best practices to both decrease the size of these catheters, as well as to better close the hole in the blood vessel when the catheter is removed. We also have devices that can assist with that closure and prevent bleeding from that femoral artery. So we've seen, I've seen a significant reduction in the risk associated with the impellent supported procedure uh, for protective PCI. Okay, great. And I think that we see Justin able to join us, which Hi. is- Hi. Hi, Justin. You should be able to share your, there you go. There you are. Hi, Justin. Good to see you. Um, yeah, for some reason, I'm, I don't see y'all anymore. Um, oh, we got you now? Yes, we oh, see you. Go. Right. Good to see you guys. Good to see you, Justin. Well, we've just talked about coronary artery disease, heart failure, and protected PCI. But Justin, um, Everyone would love to hear from you, your story, and how you're doing today. I'm doing great, but yeah, you know, I listened, to, I heard most of it, and I thought you were describing my life. <laughs> um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Justin, um, born and raised in Texas. I'll be 75 in April. Had my first heart attack when I was 41 years old, about two months in the future. Now it'll be uh, whatever that is, a lot of numbers, been a long time. I, uh, I, fo I followed my father's uh, footprints. He had his first heart attack at 47, I was 41. Um, he passed away at 70 with a massive heart attack in 1988. And fortunately, just in a very few years after that, technology really bloomed in the cardiology field. So it's really been in my favor. Um, the first heart attack was extreme pain in the chest and down the arm, like Bobby was describing. Um, I probably went, I was probably having the heart attack for about two days, I thought I had indigestion and just kept taking Rolaids and stuff like that, thinking, ah, it's going to go away. Well, it didn't. When 
I finally went to the ER in early morning hours. Uh, entire LAD had shut down. And I guess they call that the widow maker. And um, I lost about 45% of my heart muscle due to damage from that. Um, through the next several years, I had, um, I had stents and angioplasts where they did balloons. And then in 1993, I had my first heart attack, it was 86. And I, they did a triple bypass in 83. I continued to have angina and was using a bottle of nitro a month and um, finally went to a spray and it was just a daily part of my life. And um, I was in and out of the cath lab a couple of times a year uh, for several years. Uh, I, I then had another um, bypass in 2004 and did I lose you? No, you're still with us, Justin. Yeah, you still got us. Okay, I'm walking towards my charger. Um, this is eating a lot of energy. But anyway, I had my second quad bypass in uh, 2003. Then I ended up, uh, I had the same cardiologist for 17 years. He finally said in 2012, I'm not going to treat you anymore after 17 years. And I thought, wow, this is bad. He said, oh, you just take your meds and remember you've lived a good life. And um, I, my wife had passed away and I remarried and moved to another location. And so I did start doing research. Uh-oh, I think we lost him. Yeah. Uh, and at this at the just the time that he was getting to the PCI protected PCI, right? Well, hopefully he'll sign back in once he yes. uh, connects to a charger. Yes. That's okay. We have lots of questions. And so we can field a couple more questions if you're okay with that. Um the next question is, is the protected PCI procedure compatible with a patient who has had an ICD? Absolutely. Patients who've had an ICD can still have um, this procedure and that doesn't preclude from having a protected PCI procedure. Um, while, while we're waiting for Justin to come back, I did wanna emphasize um, one important aspect. He was his own advocate. And when his surgeon said there's no other options, he and his wife took it upon themselves to look for other options. So sometimes uh, a surgeon may not be com comfortable with these high-risk procedures or a cardiologist, but uh, you can ask for a referral to another cardiologist who may do these procedures. These are very specialized procedures, so not every cardiologist performs them. Um, but it's important if you're not having the answers that you want and feel that you need a second opinion, that you speak up and ask for a second opinion. Great. I'm back in case you want me to finish. <laughs> we do. We're anxiously we, awaiting. Yes. Uh, we were just right answering there on the more questions. Cliffhanger. Um, anyway, I had, this, had the second bypass surgery. Uh, things were going pretty good until the cardiologist told me that. Um, I, w I wasn't really, I went about seven years without any issues, which was a major milestone in my life. But I knew that that wouldn't last. And so doing the research, I found a new cardiologist that all his credentials were really good. And so I started using him in 2012 and uh, November of 2013, I had tremendous 
chest pain. And so I really knew what was going on and just kind of did my own stress test, walked and I, I barely could make it to the mailbox. So I went to him and he just sent me straight to the cath lab. And uh, uh, he said, I, he said, this is bad. He said, you're almost completely blocked on your right main uh, coronary artery. He said, the graft, he said, you don't even have a native artery left. And so, and, that, and he's, I said, well, doc, you gotta do what you gotta do. I said, you know, what do I do? And he said, well, we've got a new device called the Impella. He said, we're going to put it in your left side. He had already gone through my right uh, femoral artery and he had the catheter in the heart. And but he was afraid to deploy because he was going to shut off all the blood to my heart. And um, so uh, they did my left side and put in another catheter and um, which was really no big deal. This happened pretty fast. And, um, you know, and he said, we're, we're, we're going to use a pump to uh, support you while we do put some more stents in. And I didn't really totally understand it. I mean, I understood the principle basically is I don't like to be medicated when they do the heart cast because I like to watch the monitor. I know that's kind of crude, but I enjoy it. And uh, so they turned the pump on and it's like they turned all the lights on in the cath lab. It got real bright. And all of a sudden I felt really good. And uh, I guess it was the lack of blood flowing, but uh, he put in two stents end to end and um, I was out of there in about 30 minutes. And um, this was late in the afternoon and I wanted to go home but he made me spend the night. And, uh, you know, uh, the Abbey Omed rep was there. I was a little apprehensive when they pulled the, um, the, the unit out. I didn't know what to expect. And it, I just sailed through it. It was amazing. The, uh, the interesting thing was that the next morning I was ready to go to work and do my things and live on a ranch and feed horses and cows and work and work in, it was the wrong time of the year to work at the garden yet, but it, uh, you know, it's been a life changing event. Um, I was, I've saw my son get married that was 42 years old. Um, he had never been married before. He had a seven-year-old grandchild. Got to see her born. And so uh, my late, my, my present wife and I have just had our 12th year anniversary. Um, we had only been married for uh, three years when this happened. And I had given her a warning, you know, and... Uh, I actually went back to work last year. I've been working a year and a half. I just worked part time, but I'm having a blast. Um, you know, the original heart damage is still there and there's nothing can be done about that because that muscle was damaged so early in my life. But if it were not for the Impella device, I would not be here. The, my cardiologist was pretty blunt about it, that he said, I 95% block for the right main graft. And all I have left is grafts, there are no natives. And so uh, yeah, I'm running, running pretty good. I do, uh, I do what I want. I can walk a mile or two if I want to. I, uh, I do a lot of garden work. I grow a huge garden every year, can all of our vegetables that we eat. And uh, my wife works full time still. So I do the housework and work a couple of days a week and do the laundry, mow the yard. And my daughter lives 
next door and I mow hers too. So um, life is good. That's great. It's so good to hear. So we do have questions and we have some for you, Justin. Um, while we're getting into questions, if you want to flip your camera on um, so everybody can see you again, that would be great. There and we are. There you are. Yeah. And we love to be able to see you when we're talking. Well, I love questions. I've, I've been doing this kind of stuff. I like to give back. Um, I work with senior citizens and that's part of my reason why is because I can. And uh, I like giving my testimony uh, in hopes that uh, someone will, that's been told they can't do anything for them will understand there's options out there. There's a lot of people that are high risk like me that have been told to take a hike. That's not a very pleasant feeling, I'll tell you. Yeah. So somebody asked what your current um, ejection fraction was after the procedure. After the procedure, it was 23. Before the procedure, it was not measurable. It was so low. Wow. And somebody wants to know how old you are. Are we allowed I'm, to ask that? That's um, Yeah, I'm 74, be 75 in April. I don't mind. <laughs> Great. Um, so this question is for you, Dr. Bogave. The Protected PCI procedure, can it be performed in any hospital or is it only in certain locations? So it's only by high risk uh, interventionalists. So not every cardiologist who performs stents can do a protected PCI. So it depends on your hospital and the cardiologist who are at your hospital. So, so even at a particular hospital, every interventional cardiologist doesn't necessarily perform these high-risk procedures. As you can imagine, with this being a higher-risk procedure, um, there are specific cardiologists who do a higher volume of these procedures, so they become better and better at it, and that's why we've seen a reduction in risk associated with the procedure. So you want uh, to see a cardiologist who does this frequently. And uh, if your cardiologist doesn't do Impala supported protective PCIs, ask them to refer you to a colleague who does perform these procedures. Yes. Right. And so what kind of percentage of a gain with the ejection fraction would somebody expect to see with a PCI? So in Justin's case, um, remember he, his first heart attack, there was a long delay before he had treatment. So he went two days before coming in. So he had a lot of damage with his very first heart attack. So his remaining heart has to work over time to make up for the heart muscle that's now scar tissue. And that's why even though Justin's ejection fraction was not even measurable to now 23%, um, even though the, at 23% for someone else that they may be very, very symptomatic for Justin, he's able to do anything that he wants to do and does it is not limited by shortness of breath or chest pain. When we performed a study looking at patients' ejection fractions before this procedure and then measured it 90 days after the procedure, we saw ejection fractions improve on the average of about 15%. So before the procedure, they were below 35%, around 30% on average. And after the procedure, they were closer to 45% on average. But more importantly, those patients had a dramatic improvement in their symptoms of both chest pain or an their angina, yes. as well as a dramatic improvement in their heart failure symptoms. So they weren't as short of breath, they weren't as tired as well. So that's more meaningful even to a cardiologist than ejection fraction alone. Yeah, that's the way it was in my case. Um, my cardiologist said, he said, I don't care about your numbers. I want to see how you're doing physically and mentally. And I got back, I, I had no, I haven't had a nitro 
since 2013. I don't need them. And I, it's been, um, I, like I say, I, I do what I want. Do I get tired? Yes. I rest when I get tired, but I know what my limitations are, but I've had this level of this in my normal life and I've had it for a long time. And I, I absolutely know without this uh, protected uh, PCI, I, would, I wouldn't be here. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And um, I, I, I would not go to any cardiologist if, if I were traveling unless they had the impella to support any type of intervention. And that can happen at any time. Yeah. So speaking of that, um, someone brings up a really great question. And so they under, we understand we have to be our own advocate, but where can people start to find a cardiologist who will even consider the protected PCI or other treatments? Um, because most of the time insurance companies aren't going to just keep allowing you to go to numerous specialty appointments and continue to pay for it. So is there a way that somebody can search um, for cardiologists or heart centers that do those procedures? Well, if you're asking me, Bobby, I, you probably should answer that. I go nearly every major medical facility in a major, major metro area now has a hospital that has uh, the ability to use the Impella device. From my understanding, they're all over DFW area. I know that. So there, there is a website, Impella.com. It's spelled I-M-P-E-L-L-A.com, where you can go to and find a center close to you that uses the Impella device to perform high-risk PCI or protected PCI. Um, I did see another question come through the chat. Is it the stents or the Impala device that contribute to the improvement in ejection fraction? And the benefit of the Impala device is it provides um, blood flow to the rest of the body. So it decreases the stress on the heart and allows the cardiologist to spend more time opening blood vessels as you heard Justin talk about, his cardiologist was very nervous opening his last remaining blood vessel, his bypass graft to his heart. So by placing the Impella device, this is doing the work and allows the cardiologist all the time they need to open up that artery. And when they open up that artery, there's a very brief moment where they have to completely stop all blood flow through that artery. So that's the moment of risk. But if you have this device providing blood flow, you can, you can very briefly interrupt blood flow to the heart muscle, and it's not going to cause a patient to have a cardiac arrest and um, for them to be at, at risk of dying during the procedure. The other thing is, remember, heart failure can have a cause such as a heart attack or high blood pressure. But also, when your heart muscle is weak, there are hormones that your body releases to try to compensate for that. They're released from the kidney um, as well as the brain, and that causes the heart failure to progress even after a heart attack. So when you have a, a procedure such as a stenting procedure and the heart is stressed during that procedure without the Impella device, it causes all those hormones to increase that can cause um, increased stress of the heart long after the procedure. So the improvement in ejection fraction is number one, due to the improvement in blood flow from the stents, but number two, because the heart was not stressed during that procedure and you didn't see this release of bad hormones that cause progression of the heart failure. Excellent, thank you for that explanation. Um, so we just have a couple more questions. One I think is a great question. Um, and it's probably for you, Dr. Bogave, as a novice with ejection fraction, how does somebody 
find out what their ejection fraction is. So like you have to go to your cardiologist, but what will your cardiologist do to find out what your ejection fraction is? The most common test we use to determine ejection fraction is called an echocardiogram. It's an ultrasound of the heart. Um, so you would have a procedure where they put some cold jelly on your chest, take some pictures using an ultrasound, and we can measure the ejection fraction. We can also measure ejection fraction if you have a cardiac catheterization where they inject dye into the main ventricle, the left ventricle, and we can measure it in the cath lab. You can also have it measured with a cardiac MRI. But the most common test used to measure ejection fraction is the echocardiogram. I will say there's two very, very important parts of the heart function. Number one, the way the heart beats, which that is the ejection fraction, but equally important is how the heart relaxes. And so that's why with Justin, with an, with an ejection fraction of 23%, without even seeing your echocardiogram, I would tell you based on your symptoms or lack of symptoms, Justin, your heart relaxes very well. So you don't have a problem filling up your heart muscle. Um, some people have a problem with filling up the heart muscle as well as pumping, and they're gonna have far more symptoms than someone who just has a pumping problem. You're exactly right, Bobby. Of course you are because you're a cardiologist, but I was evaluated for transplant and or LVAD and because my heart does relax very well, it refills really well. And the end result was neither would give me a better quality of life. Well, it's hard to improve on your quality of life. Um, if I could have my husband do laundry um, and garden <laughs> and housework, I wouldn't change the thing. <laughs> That's kind of how the way I looked at it and, and my wife also. I so, agree. I hey, think that's a great quality of life. Yeah, too much risk. I uh, I enjoy doing all that, and um, and you I still want to be a volunteer. That's amazing. Yeah, I uh, I love life. I love being able to share my story with people. Um, it's I I have sent so many people that have had. Protected, protected PCIs over the last 10 years or so. That's it's really pretty crazy how, how many people I've sent and, uh, and without having to buy, have bypasses and get a few stents and, and live more productive lives. Uh, well, so Justin, it's, thank you for sharing your story. You're giving, I know so many people on this call hope that they can have an improvement in their quality of life. And these innovations um, have saved thousands of patients like you, Justin. Yep. The most important thing is if your cardiologist is not giving you answers or giving you hope, seek a second opinion because there are many procedures, yes. including the protective PCI that can give you hope and a better future. Yeah. That's fabulous. So um, would, could the impella device be used when the heart failure is due to a left bundle branch block? Or is it strictly for from coronary artery disease? So today we talked about the impella CP device, which is uh, this device and protective PCI. We also have other devices that we can use if someone comes in with just a heart muscle problem and what we call cardiogenic shock. And, and those are often placed by a surgeon in the artery under the collarbone called the axillary artery. And you can see those, those are a little bit larger. Um, that's a larger device and provides more blood flow. And sometimes it can bridge a patient to heart recovery. Or if they do need a transplant, we sometimes need to place this in to keep the blood flowing to their brain and their kidneys until they can receive a heart transplant. But we do have a whole family of Impella devices. The Impella CP is primarily for patients who have an acute heart attack and may come in with, with cardiogenic shock or a weak heart muscle in the setting of a heart attack. And the cardiologist needs to open um, the artery in the setting of a heart attack. Or in Justin's case, where there are blockages 
in their coronary arteries and maybe one or even more blockages. And we do that not in the setting of a heart attack, but because of worsening symptoms of chest pain or heart failure. And then also when the heart muscle itself is affected, we can see that um, with heart muscle disease or even after any open heart surgery procedure, sometimes the heart muscle uh, fails early after surgery and we can support it with a different impella pump. But our goal with the entire impella platform is to bridge patients to heart recovery so they can keep their heart and have improvement in their symptoms um, as well as their ejection practice. And are all of the impella devices temporary? So like you wouldn't put the impella device in and be sent home, is that correct? Or maybe I'm wrong. So all of our current impella devices are temporary. We are launching a, a brand new study. It will be a first in human study in the next few months called a bridge to recover device that will be very similar to this device. Um, and the first, the first few patients will be kept in the hospital, but the ultimate goal with that device is to provide longer support to patients, again, with the goal of heart recovery, but they will be able to go home for several months and have the device in place and then come back with the goal of removing the device and improving their heart function after it's had time to rest and oh. be treated with medications or perhaps another procedure even such as the one Justin had, or a heart valve procedure. Fabulous. So we have one, well, we have two questions, but it's kind of the same question. Um, people are curious about what medications, Justin, that you're on, and if you still need to take medications after the protective PCI. Um, yes. So can we address that? Oh, yeah. I'd be glad to. I uh, Yes, I still take medications. Uh, uh, about four years ago, I started developing AFib, uh, which is common with heart damage to have AFib. I had a complete ablation. So I am on Eliquis, a blood thinner. I take Plavix also. Uh, I take um, Carvedilol and I take Entresto for heart failure. Um, plus, I'm a diabetic, so I take the diabetic meds, and uh, and I, I take a, a very mild dose of a statin, um, just three times a week. My cholesterol's managed very well now, and uh, but yeah, I'm I'll be taking that stuff the rest of my life, and I'm not worried about it. And yeah. It's just part of life, it, you know. It's uh, part of what keeps me going. Yeah. Well, Justin, the medications are an important part of heart recovery. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly the medications you're taking for your coronary artery disease or your cholesterol medication um, and the medications for heart failure. Remember, I talked about the hormones that contribute to progression of heart failure. It is critically important that you're on good medications to control those hormones and prevent the progression. And the good news is we've had recent clinical trials that show a tremendous benefit of the medications. And our most uh, recent clinical trial looking at protective PCI for patients who have coronary artery disease like you, Justin, we mandate that those patients have to be on recommended therapies. And there are four major medications for heart failure patients. There's a beta blocker like Cargadolol. There's also something called a RAS inhibitor. And I saw someone say they were on Entresto. Entresto is a RAS inhibitor. Yes. Um, then there's something called an MRA, um, such as aldosterone or a plerinone. And then the fourth one is a diabetic medication called an SGLT2 inhibitor. Farsiga is an example, Jardians is an example. But now those diabetic medications are approved for heart failure patients, even without diabetes. Yes. And all of those have shown to keep patients out of the hospital. And we see after the protective PCI, it's critically important that you are placed on these medications to continue to improve your symptoms um, and, and improve your quality of life and keep you out of the hospital. No, well, I, I I failed to mention it, but I take Farsiga, and uh, 
Uh, it, I mean, it look, Farsiga alone lowers your chance of another heart attack 50%. Uh, it's, there's some pretty impressive uh, papers out there on some of these meds. And of course, I take out Dactone. And the ones you listed are imperative for somebody with like, like me. And I know there's a lot of us out there. Yeah, and I think it's really important to end on that note that this is a lifelong journey, right? And we're not going oh, yeah. to solve something overnight. Uh, medication management and adherence to your medication is just as important as um, you know getting a specific procedure. Uh, I think as we work as a team together with our physicians and our doctors that we can find a treatment plan that works and, and fits our life. And I just wanted to say, Justin, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. You are an inspiration to many. Um, and Dr. Bogave, thank you so much for the information and for sharing um, such fabulous information um, about treatment options that we can go out and look at. So thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed um, the presentation and we will be back soon. Have a great day. Right. Thanks, Andrea. Bye-bye.